Quentin Tarantino and Robert Arikas are here. They are filmmakers whose work consistently entertains and, yes, surprises audiences. They are close friends who also work together. Each advises and contributes to the other's movies. Now they have teamed up and they share top billing. Their double feature is called Grindhouse. It is a tribute to the exploitative B-movies of the 1960s and 1970s. Rodriguez's film is called Planet Terror. Tarantino's is Death Proof. Here is the trailer to Grindhouse. Two adrenaline-fueled roller coasters. One ticket to ride. In two and a half hours of pure dynamite. Planet Terror and Death Proof. Only at the Grindhouse. I think I know the answer looking at that <laughs> that trailer, right. but tell me what Grindhouse means. Well, Grindhouse, I do believe it was a, a, a variety coin term, but w what it represented was um, old dilapidated uh, movie theaters that are in the, like, the urban areas, the big city urban areas of America, like Kansas City or uh, 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 Chattanooga or Los Angeles or New York or Chicago. And... Uh, and they were like old dilapidated theaters, and in some cases, like might have been the big, you know, yeah. vaudeville houses right, of the right, day, right. showing basically exploit, you know, double and triple features of exploitation movies of all kind of, you know, lurid subject matter, right. whether it be horror films or sexploitation nurse movies or cheerleader <laughs> movies or black exploitation movies, yeah. you know, and you always kind of took your life a little bit in your hands by going to see it, but it just showed your commitment to cinema all the more. <laughs> now, a lot of sex, a lot of violence. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. Now, why did you want to do this now? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, it's well. I, I've always been bemoaning that that whole you know, type of cinema leaving. And uh, you even have film festivals about yeah. it. Oh no, exactly. That's and that actually is kind of where this actually pretty much started. It was the idea that uh, me and Robert. Uh, I've been like screening. I've been, I have film print collection. And I've been screening movies at my house, and they're kind of similar to what the Grindhouse show is: double features with trailers <laughs> right. handpicked by me in the middle, right. and kind of creating this ambiance of the night. And then I had such fun doing that that I've been doing this film festival for about ten years in Austin now, where I take a bunch of prints over and put them together for the mm -hmm. night and robert goes to every single one of them he sits right next to <laughs> me yeah. being an austin resident yeah by the exactly way. and it's so great and i've even like taken it you know and done it in a few other places i did, did it at the seattle film festival once and so we've just been doing this for a decade and just having a great time doing it and really part of it was one of robert's ideas let's do an, a, a a quentin night at the movies the way you know he does it but let's do it for on a grand scale and release it in three thousand theaters and really yeah. entertain the world with it <laughs> and here it is here it is now, before we go there, let's go back a little bit and talk about this friendship. You two met at the Toronto Film Festival? Film Festival 92, because I had El Mariachi, which I came to talk to you yeah, about. And he had Reservoir Dogs. So right. we both had our first film out, and we are kind of doing the festival circuit together. Right. And we ended up being on panels where we do panel discussions that they put us on together about violence in the movies in the yeah, 90s, exactly. even though it was only 92. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Uh, yeah. It was already a uh, subject, because <laughs> we came out right at the same time, and his guys were violent and black, and mm -hmm. so was mine, and... We had to kind of explain ourselves to the festival crowd because right. uh, we both kind of made exploitation movies and ended yeah. up in film yeah, exactly, festivals yeah. as high art. Yeah, so, it, was like, uh, <laughs> it was like me, you, the romper stomper guy, <laughs> right. and uh, man, man bites dog. Uh, yeah, and the man bites dog guys. All right, we're uh, we're probably <laughs> double dating. All right, yeah. <laughs> but we got on really well, and yeah. um, it was a thing we commented on. We said, "Wow, if I had known you mm -hmm. in high school, we would have been best friends." Because yeah. I was trying to make movies even back then, since I was twelve. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's a writer and a director as well. It's hard to find people who ha are like-minded yeah, when you're right. that kind of person. But what would normally happen is you meet somebody like at a festival, and you never see him again. But we got on really well, and he said, oh, you're going to like my next thing, Pulp Fiction. I'm writing that. I went back to my where I was writing Desperado at Columbia Pictures, and he ended up having an office two doors down, which I didn't know he was there. So we ended up hanging out all through the writing of Pulp Fiction and Desperado mm -hmm. and just becoming really good friends. And then I finally cast him in Desperado. So this is now our sixth collaboration yeah. because we had so much fun working together and being friends first and then working together and liking each other's work. So, and just really encouraging each other, right. you know. It was like I was inspired by my thing and I had to explain it to him and he was like the perfect audience for it. So <laughs> his enthusiasm got me excited and it was versa vice when it came to Desperado. Yeah. All right, now this for Grindhouse. Mm-hmm. Uh, but how did you decide how to do this and who's going to go first and who's going to go second and, and how it's going to come together and and which one is better? Well, what I think how it even started <laughs> was um, I had just done a 3D movie. 3D yeah. movies had been dead for a while and I did a movie for Spy Kids 3D. It did really well. I remembered going to the theater and putting on glasses and I thought audiences might get a kick out of it. They haven't seen it since the 80s. 
And so I brought it back. And now 3D movies have come back because that did so well. And I was trying to think of the next thing that was a theatrical experience like that that I'd forgotten about. And I just remember how much fun I had make, watching these double features of Quentin's. And I thought, I think I want to do a double feature. Originally, I was going to direct them both. Right. I had this idea about three years ago. But I want to do a double feature. And uh, Planet Terror was going to be one right. of them. And uh, they were going to be sort of short features, so audiences weren't in that, that long. And I kind of forgot about it when did Sin City. And then I came to Quentin uh, with the idea, because I saw one of the double feature posters from, from way back when laying on his floor. And I had the same poster <laughs> on my floor back in my house that inspired me. And I said, and what was the poster? I, it was called uh, Dra Drag Strip Girl and Rock All Night, two Roger Corman right. AIP right. movies from the, from the, the king of the movies. Yeah, from exactly, the 50s. yeah. I said, I, I wanted to do a movie like that, but... You should do one, and I should do one together. And he said, "Oh, we got to call it Grindhouse." Within five minutes, we had the whole idea, mm -hmm. and we said, uh, "I'll go first in alphabetical order, but maybe in Texas, I'll headline, and in LA, you'll headline." <laughs> but um, it ended up being this thing. Once we put them together, mine seemed to be a good opener because it had the more sensationalistic stuff. But you worked on both of you. He, you edited his, you helped him, you gave advice to him. And he gave well, advice to you, or you just went off and yeah, did yeah. your separate movies and brought them together. Yes and no. I mean. Um, <clears throat> We first, actually worked we more working. on, we, we, we commented more about each other's scripts. Oh. That was where it actually kind of like worked worked out more. I moved into his guest room to write mine. <laughs> yeah, uh, <laughs> and, and we kind of hung out through that. Yeah. yeah, and then when he, he, he shot his first, so I was actually on his set like a lot. And... Um, and he was kind of grooming me to be my own DP. So I was actually, he was actually telling me to like uh, operate second camera. So I'd get like right. used to it and get right. you know familiar with it. And it was actually kind of just fun. I would just like, kind of like, I would hang out there. And it's like all of a sudden, if I saw an actor was getting distracted while Robert was working on something, I'd run lines with them or, you know, <laughs> yeah. give them a little coaching or something like that and send them off to do, act yeah. in front of Robert. So it was fun. Tell me what Planet of Terror is about. Planet of Terror is... Uh, these kind of exploitation movies always seized on something that was happening during the day, even before Hollywood wanted to right. talk about them. Mm -hmm. And uh, this was, I thought, well, if I'm going to do a zombie movie, let's make it an infection that comes back. A biotech kind of infection. That comes back from the Iraqi war. Right. Right. So that it's something that's current and something that people might fear, and you're exploiting that, you know, to, to a horrible degree. It comes back and takes over this entire small town. It's going to spread all over the world if a go-go dancer, a wrecker, a sheriff, and a doc don't become more than they are to take over it and, and try to stop it. And of course, they can't. So. Yeah, and, and, and who is the principal actor? Mm -hmm. There's several leads, but I think Rose McGowan plays yeah. this go-go dancer who loses her leg and her boyfriend, the, the, the wrecker, <laughs> Ray, it, who seems yeah. to know how to do everything because he's like this uh, mythical superhero, gives her a machine gun leg. Okay, here and, is uh, Cherry Darling, played by Rose, uh, Rose McGowan. Take a look at this clip. Yeah, that was your idea. That was my idea, the radio. <laughs> but I was doing the, the scene. He goes, he, it needs some, I, was, I was filming it, and he, he comes back because he's watching the monitor. I shoot in HD so that yeah. everybody can see really right. clear right. the monitor. And he's looking at the monitor, and, and he can see so clearly. He can see the radio way in the back. Do you notice that in the framing, you got the radio way back there? It'd be a great little button if she shoots the radio. Go, what radio? I can't even see it on the set. No, I look at the monitor. Oh, now I can see it. You shoot everything in HD? <laughs> yeah. And so what I did with this, that was the whole idea. I thought, oh, this will be great. I'll shoot digital. Yeah. But I'll use my special effects to make it look like an old film print from the yeah. 70s. Yeah. So it looks like an old film and all deteriorated, uh, all, all as an effect. Yeah, there's a great story about that. You know this really well. In the beginning, when they were doing B movies, mm -hmm. they would make about, what, 20, 10 copies, yeah. and they'd start in New York. If that. If that. Uh, yeah. 10 copies. That's a wide release. That's a wide release, 10 prints. Warner Brothers did 10 copies. So one would start in New York, <laughs> one little copy, yeah, uh -huh. one print. Mm -hmm. show here, then go to Philadelphia, yeah. then maybe down to Washington, yeah, exactly. then out to Chicago, and, and then maybe to Phoenix. Yeah. Well, I mean, actually, you're actually starting the high end. Probably starting in Chattanooga, <laughs> all right, is where it started. Um, I don't know what movie you're talking about. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> it, 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 it wasn't a great it one. Yeah. Yeah, well, but by the time it got to yeah. Chattanooga, mm -hmm. or wherever it was going, yeah. it had been scratched. Oh, yeah. It, it had, I mean, they're it, playing in the worst projectors, yeah. you know, exactly. that were in operation. And so whoever saw it after the 10th screening yeah, exactly. saw something different than the people in 
beginning. But the weird thing is, is like having a big, having a film print collection, you know, that becomes almost part of the experience and yeah. either showing them at my house or showing them in Austin at the film festival I do, kind of the quality of the print creates this communal atmosphere inside yeah. of the cinema <laughs> and uh, about like, oh, oh, and also uh, we're playing with the idea that these prints are kind of like Frankenstein monsters. They're kind of made up of different sources. So you could watch a print and this reel is all red, this reel is faded, <laughs> but then all of a sudden there's this IB Technicolor reel and there it looks gorgeous. <laughs> all right, take a look at this. This is another scene from Planet Terra. You see, you pointed at what you want to die and you pulled a little trigger here. A little bullet comes out of here. A little bullet hits you right there. And you know what? You don't look like Eva Gardner no more. Let me get this straight. You ran out of money. <laughs> I ran out of money. No, I ran out of interest. And you in couldn't get a actors. professional actor. <laughs> the, the actors I saw just weren't up to snuff. And he read at the table. We we're doing a table yeah. reading just to hear it. And he read the lines, and we're like, everyone there just went. Quentin's got to do it. I wasn't yeah. supposed to do it. It literally was, uh, Quentin, take this role. All right, we're at the script reading. Yeah. <laughs> it's like very Grindhouse fashion. The cameraman, yeah. now in the movie. Yeah, it's like my, my name of my character is Rapist Number One. All right, <laughs> Quentin, play Rapist Number One. Right. <laughs> you know, there was a time in your life which you, you really wanted to act a lot. Yeah. Do you still have that? Bug. I've lost bug. the bug. You have? I have lost the bug. I, I, me I remember talking about the bug <laughs> in, <laughs> right at here. this table. At this table. All right. Yeah. I'm very passionate about it, and I've lost it. And but Charlie, kind of glad I lost it. Actually. He's so good in this movie. And I can see how it's going to revive a career. I think the bug is back. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of bug? I'm loving what kind of, all the what praise. Kind of bug is right. it? <laughs> I'm loving the praise. <laughs> the bug the infection is spreading. <laughs> I, I, got, I got the other side of praise on my acting for a long time. Time, so I'm appreciating it now. Like, There's a whole bunch of stuff here. And tell me about the fake trailer, mm -hmm. well, which is yeah. Well, the thing is, what we did is, uh, you know, part of our thing to do with this movie was we wanted to create, you know, truly like the experience of going to the movies back in the '70s and yeah. these kind of theaters. And look, you know, uh, you know, Planet Terror. You take it out of the grindhouse and you you show it. It's got to work completely as a movie on itself without any of this other stuff. Same thing about Death Proof, but you put it together. It needs to actually be even more than just like buying a ticket to a movie. It needs to be a ride. It needs to be the grindhouse experience from beginning to end. And the only way to really do that is to create all the stuff that, that bracketed these two movies and actually have an intermission with wild trailers from different uh, uh, exploitation genres and really kind of give that whole experience. And so Robert did one of them himself. Machete, which is sort of a it stars the actor Danny Trejo. Robert's always been saying he's the Mexican Charles Bronson and like mexploitation. Yeah, mexploitation, mexploitation, <laughs> and so uh, that really gets everything going. And then, um, in just uh, yeah, we're me and Robert were just excited about our project, so we have other friends, so we're just mentioning it to them. Uh, Eli Roth, right, uh, who did a uh, Hostel, Edgar Wright, who did Shaun of the Dead, right, uh, uh, Rob Zombie. We would just bring it up, and then they were like, "Wow, that sounds amazing! I'd like to do one of those," you know. And, <laughs> so, <laughs> and, and, and we're actually dealing with guys who are actually as savvy about this stuff as we are. So, like, just uh, just as an example. Uh, Edgar Wright does one. Now, his is like a British horror film from the 70s, but it's the American trailer, which means they never let any of the actors talk because in America, they didn't want anyone to know that it was a British movie <laughs> until you're already in the theater. <laughs> it's too late. <laughs> it's too late. We got the money. <laughs> we got, we the, got money. the money. <laughs> let them know. Tell me about your film. Tell me about uh, uh, Death Room. Death right, right. Uh, well, the thing about it was um, Robert... You know, Robert had come up with his idea of maybe sometime around the time of faculty and maybe wrote 30 pages on it. So as soon as we came up with the idea of doing Grindhouse and we decided, well, we should definitely work in the horror genre. That right. would be really cool. A good way to start this off. Um, <laughs> that, you know, he already kind of knew what he wanted to do. And I love the idea of doing a zombie movie mm -hmm. or infected people. Infected people. <laughs> <laughs> Let's clarify. We try not to use that's the a, Z. We try not to use the Z word. Yeah, the genre. Yeah, it's a subgenre <laughs> inside of the Z genre. <laughs> um, I had actually just got through 
rewatching all the slasher films because right. it's kind of what I do. I'm like, you know, it's like I'm I'm going for my professorship in cinema. <laughs> no, the, you, day, the day I die, <laughs> I've graduated. All right, that's, um, that's one of your great lines. Yeah. By the way. <laughs> Thank you. You can you live. You will be learning until the moment you breathe your last breath. That's it. That's it. And part of the way of doing that is picking a director, picking an actor, picking a genre, and just kind of reworking, you know, looking at them all again, writing notes, maybe for a future book or something, and putting it away and starting on something else. Yeah. Anyway, I just finished doing the slasher thing. And uh, so I go, oh, I want to do a slasher film. But then it, you know, it, you know, hit me that the things that I like about the slasher films is structurally anyway, they're exactly the same. And that's actually what's kind of good about them is you can look at them as one big giant group. And I go, well... That's a little too self-reflective, all right? The movie's got to have its own pulse, its own heartbeat. It's my movie. Um, so I decided to try to try to do with slasher films what I, what I did with heist films in Reservoir Dogs, right. which is my, my own crazy cockamamie version of it. And, and then I remembered something I'd heard a long, long time ago that's, you know, I'm a writer. You hear stuff, it's yeah, in a right. locked room until the room gets <laughs> opened, all right? And this is 10 years ago. Yeah. I used to have this indestructible feeling about myself all right before especially before i'd ever done anything before because i figured look god put me here to be a filmmaker he gave me this stuff he's not gonna take me out of here before i've done something with this stuff. <laughs> a film he likes yeah <laughs> or she likes yeah yeah exactly <laughs> And so I never worried about dying in a car crash. I never worried about dying in a plane crash. I'm from Los Angeles, earthquakes, poosh, uh, who cares? Uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm here. I've got a mission. I'm here to do something. Well, after Pulp Fiction, I thought, you know what? Maybe I did it. <laughs> maybe I'm not so indestructible. And dramatically speaking, maybe taking me out right now is a good idea. So um, all of a sudden, uh, <laughs> I got a Volvo. <laughs> a Volvo? <laughs> a Volvo. Because yeah, I wanted to be on a right, safe right, right. car. Well, I remember talking to somebody about that worked in movies, and they said, well, you know what you can do? I go, what? You could, uh, uh, you can buy any car you want, and you give it to a stunt team, give them $10,000, and they'll make it death proof. Well, that just always stayed in my mind. I always thought that was an interesting concept. So then when I was thinking about a story, I'm like, well, what about a guy He's a killer. He's like the boogeyman, uh, except, you know, he's human. He's not a supernatural figure. He's a maybe a demented stuntman, and and maybe he has a death proof <laughs> Maybe car. he's Kurt Russell. <laughs> yeah, maybe he's Kurt Russell. <laughs> you know, uh, and, and the whole idea was, you know, there is this whole sexual thing with some people about car crashes. They've worked into a sexual thing. And I go, well, what if he had a death proof car that he could – get into any crash he wanted, all right? It would be the sexual rapist-like experience, but he's going to survive the crash because of his car. And then it was like, well, that's it. That's my slasher film, except yeah. he's got a car instead. And that's my sexual metaphor. It's everything. And I go, wow, I've never seen that movie before. And the thing that was exciting about coming up with it, because actually I would have come up with this if Robert hadn't inspired me to like try to fit up, come, come up with something was it's the first time since Reservoir Dogs that I came up with an idea like on the spot and then just sat down and wrote it. You know, even like one of the, you know, the John Travolta, Uma Thurman story in Pulp Fiction had been in my mind for right, a long right, time. Right, right. Kill Bill had been in my mind for, even Jackie Brown I'd read years before and thought about making a movie of it then. So this was the first time that I came up with a good idea and just sat down and faced a blank page and four months later it was finished. Right, Sin City. Sin City, when's the next one? I'd probably start shooting in June, so. How many be, will there be? Might do two and then do a, maybe a series. A series we can then put a on television series. Yeah. yeah. So we can then put on DVD. It did very well, package. didn't it? did really well. Yeah. yeah. And how, I love that. What, how do you explain it? I mean, how to explain the success? The success, of it? yeah. You Beyond know, it's one of those. Filmmaking, but what's the thing that brings them into the theater? No, when I had the idea to do it, I'd been collecting that comic for a while. I looked at it and I, I'd been a fan of it for 10 years. And I thought, I know how to do this now with the effects that I can do at my, my studio. I don't know if audiences are ready for. It might be a little weird. It's black and white. It's anthology. It's voiceovers. All the things you're not supposed to do in a movie. But I really feel like I want to make it. People might not discover it till DVD. Um, but people got it from the first trailer. People just wanted to see something new. And I think that was the idea we had with this as well. Is that Have you seen 300? Like, I haven't seen 300 yet, only because I've been so busy. But I've been telling Frank, I will go see 300. <laughs> but that <laughs> was a product of yeah. something like Sin City. I mean, those kind of movies are product of the risk we took on Sin City, and they pay off. And I think it creates a whole other way of telling a story visually. Right. What's next for you? Well, uh, it'll probably be, uh, I can't imagine it won't be, uh, it'll be this uh, 
Dirty Dozen style World War II thing oh, that I've been right. talking you've, you've about, been for, a about that for a long time. Yeah, that. I've been writing on it for a long time. And what's the title? Uh, Inglorious In Bastards. Glorious, right, right. And uh, uh, the, th the only the only reason I hadn't done it yet is because it just expanded into such a thing that it literally was I was writing a novel. All right. Well, now I I can't reveal it, but now I know how to do a novel. All right. And yeah, I think you can do that now. All right. In cinema or even on television. So uh, actually, in a weird way. The general, the public's general interest in entertainment and the way it's done has caught up with what I always wanted to do with it. Because at some point I almost abandoned it and like I'll just have to turn it into a book. Yeah. But now, I mean, it, I could do it as a miniseries. I could do it as anything. Beyond Inglorious, is there some other great idea that's banging around there that you've been wanting to do, but the time is not quite right? You know, um, oh, that's a good the way. You, you threw a little twist right at the end there that changed my answer. Uh, um, <laughs> Uh, let me give you two, two quick answers on that. One, Inglorious Bastards is the next big mountain I need to climb exactly. before I can see the other mountains. Ah. I need to be who I'm going to be having done that, and then I'll have other horizons to cross. Having said that, I can't, you know, if there's one genre I think is the most disreputable genre out there and I never want to have anything to do with it it's the biopic I can't stand the biopics <laughs> never seen them one you like not really all right they're all just showcases for actors to win awards all right and m mostly because they want to do the story from beginning right, to right, end right, right. So but I would one of these days love to do the John Brown story yeah, he's one of my he right. biggest heroes of all time. And I'd actually like to play John Brown because I think I even kind of look like him a little <laughs> bit. But I'm actually thinking that maybe that might even be the last movie I ever make. I'll be, you know, I'll be 59, 60. I'll look the right age. I'll be the right age. And so, but that's like an unforgiven thing. That's now, like, Why is he such a hero? Because he pretty much ended slavery all by his self and was you know and like all great all like all great patriots was tried for treason <laughs> <laughs> and uh i mean you know he's you know he's he's the only white man who has ever earned a spot on black history calendars all right and like it's just they're looking you in the eye nobody nobody saw slavery the way he saw it and just hey, if we have to start killing people to stop this then they're gonna know what time it is and i love him he's my favorite american of all time Great to have you here. Great to be here. Thank Great you, to Robert. be here. Pleasure. Thank you, sir. Thank you for joining us. See you next time. Grindhouse in theaters, April 6th. See you next time.